Oklahoma is the land of second, third, and last chances. Who were the people that made it so? We'll trace the golden threads they've woven through Oklahoma history. The Red River Institute, johnjdwyer.com, and our signature sponsor, Atwoods, present Oklahoma Gold. While John J. Dwyer is completing The Oklahomans, Volume 2, he is sharing his microphone with Red River Institute board member and award-winning author, broadcaster, and avocational historian, Wade Burleson. I'm Gwen Falconer Lippert. We'll dig for the golden nuggets of Oklahoma history here now on Oklahoma Gold, The Burleson Chapters. The National Football League began in Oklahoma? Wait, Burleson, what is this story? <laughs> well, I tell you, you know, Oklahoma is filled with people who love football. Mostly college football because we don't have an NFL team, but we follow the Dallas Cowboys or the Kansas City Chiefs or the St. Louis Cardinals. And this is a story that very few people know about. I told it to the entire football team, the Oklahoma Sooners. Bob Stoops was there. Lincoln Riley was there. It was back when Baker Mayfield was the Heisman Trophy winner, quarterback for OU, and they gave a standing ovation when it was over. And it, it's an incredible gripping story of how the NFL began. So to, to set it up, let me just say this. If, if, if you were to ask someone, where did the NFL begin? They would say Pennsylvania. Of course, you know, you've got the museum in Canton. I've been to the yeah, museum. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there's a, there's a narrative of how the NFL began that is official. Now I'm going to give you the unofficial <laughs> narrative. I love it. Yeah, and it, it has its ties to the last Indian battle in the state of Oklahoma. And w when I use the term Indian, understand... I've got great friends who are Native American. I have Native American blood in me. I'm Cherokee. I'm, I'm using the term the way it used to be used. It's not politically correct today, but it's the last Indian battle in Oklahoma, April the 6th, 1875. And if you ever drive from I-40 up to Enid on Highway 81, you pass what's called Concho, which is a, a gambling site. That's the national headquarters for the Southern Cheyenne. It's on that spot the old Darlington Indian Agency, that the last Indian battle occurred April 6, 1875. The Gatlin gun was used, and over 70, to be precise, 72 savage warriors were captured by the United States government and taken captive from there up north through Enid along what we call the Chisholm Trail to Fort Leavenworth, all in chains. These Apache, Kiowa, Cheyenne Indians who'd been arrested for killing buffalo hunters in the panhandle of Texas, which is another story on T. Boone Bickens property where he lives. They'd been arrested for that. They were eventually taken to St. Augustine, Florida, to Marion, Florida, or to Marion Fort, where they were imprisoned for four years. They became businessmen. These Indians from Oklahoma became businessmen, civilized, spoke English. Their paintings hang today in the Smithsonian Institute. They're worth millions. And the government comes down and talks to the captain who was in charge of them. His, his, his name was Pratt. They talked to Captain Pratt and said, wait a minute, how did you turn these savages into civilized Americans? And he said, well, he said, I learned their language, and then I taught them the Bible, and then I taught them English, and then I taught them business and military discipline. And they said, well, Captain Pratt, we've got some problems with their boys back in Indian Territory, which is what we call Oklahoma. Can you go back and do the same thing with their boys? And Captain Pratt said, well, if you give me a place where these boys can go, uh, yeah. So the government gives to Captain Pratt the old Carlisle Barracks, which is in Pennsylvania. And then he sends one of the Indians who had been captured, his name is Okihidun. After he became a Christian, was baptized, he changed his name to David George Pendleton. I'm very good friends with his great-granddaughter. In fact, I have David Pendleton's diaries that she's given to me. He sent David Pendleton, Okihidun, a Cheyenne warrior, back to Oklahoma to get boys to take to the Carlisle Boys Institute. 
in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And it was there that Captain Pratt taught them English, business, everything he did at Fort Marion for their fathers. But he had a problem. All the boys were running away, and they didn't, want, they didn't like it. They didn't like their hair being shaved. They didn't like having to wear a suit, and, and, and so on. So Captain Pratt says to them, well, now wait a minute. What can I do to convince you to stay and stop running away? And they said, well, the white man has just invented a new game called football, and we'd like to learn football. And Captain Pratt said, I don't know anything about football, but I tell you what, if you don't run away and you stay and your grades are good, in one year I'll teach you the game of football. Well, they did. They stayed. Their grades got up, and a year later they come back, and true to his word, Captain Pratt says, okay, I'm going to teach you how to play football. So he contacts Yale, and there's a, a young man there who knows football by the name of Pop Warner. And he brings Pop Warner to Carlisle, and he teaches these Oklahoma boys how to play the new white man game called football. Well, back on the plains of Oklahoma, back where we live now today, the boys had played a game called hoop and bowl. And what they would do is they would get a hoop of feathers, they'd roll it, and, and then they'd throw a spear through it with the motion of like a quarterback throwing a ball. Well, Pop Warner at Carlisle Indian School invented the forward pass in the game of football. Now, fast forward, these Oklahoma boys become unbelievable on the football field. Nobody can beat them. Yale, they win against Yale. Harvard, you know, this is just a college game. They beat them all. There's only one team that they haven't beaten, and it's because that team won't play them. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Army at West Point. The Army was too afraid to play them? That's correct. And, and, and so Pop Warner finally, after a few years, gets West Point Army to agree to play the Oklahoma boys from the Carlisle Indian School. And in my mind, the greatest football game ever played is between the Carlisle Indians and West Point. So was the name of the Oklahoma team the Oklahoma Indians? Ah, uh, no. It was the Carlisle Indians. And there were Indians from other places other than Oklahoma. But most of them were from Indian Territory, Oklahoma. But they were all Native Americans That's from correct. the Carlisle School? Correct. In my mind, the greatest football game ever played is between the Carlisle Indians and West Point, 11 future generals for the United States Army were playing for West Point, and Jim Thorpe, the boy from Oklahoma, was the tailback for the Carlisle Indians. And when we come back in just a moment, I will tell you about this extraordinary game played in New York between the Carlisle Indians and their coach, Pop Warner, and West Point and their generals, including Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was the tailback for Army, what happened in the game, who won the game, and the establishment of the NFL after the game was over, all a result of capturing some Indians on what we call Highway 81 on April the 6th, 1875. Stitching the past to the present, this is Oklahoma Gold. So the NFL has its own story of how it began. But Wade Burleson says the NFL began in Oklahoma. Wait, Burleson, how can this be? Well, as we've just talked about, in the last Indian Battle of Oklahoma, these men who were captured and ended up capturing the fancy of all of the United States. Their story was all over the newspapers, and Captain Pratt was credited for civilizing these Native Americans. And the government asks Captain Pratt to go back to Indian Territory, what we call Oklahoma, and get their boys and take them to Carlisle and 
teach them what he taught their fathers. And as I shared with you in the last segment, eventually, in order to entice the boys to keep their grades up, Captain Pratt got Pop Warner from Yale to teach these Indian boys from Oklahoma and other states, but mostly Indian Territory, Oklahoma, how to play football, the new white man game. And so if you fast forward a few years, the Carlisle Indians beat every college team. There is no national football. They beat everyone except for the one team that won't play them, West Point, Army. And so we, we come now to 1911. Pop Warner is still the coach. His name is Glenn Scobie Warner. Jim Thorpe, the greatest athlete who's ever lived, is the tailback for the Carlisle Indians. Dwight D. Eisenhower is the tailback for West Point, for the Army cadets. There are 11 future generals who are playing for Army. And now you've got this incredible game called by a Washington Post sports reporter the greatest football game ever played between Army and the Carlisle Indians. Well, the Indian boys were fast and quick, and Army, they were big and strong. You know, back in the day, in the early days of football, it looked more like rugby than it did what we would call modern football. And so these Native Americans from Oklahoma, I mean, Army didn't know what to do with them, but so they just grinded them down. And at halftime, Army is ahead six to nothing. And in the locker room, and probably the greatest halftime speech ever given, Pop Warner shouts at these boys from Oklahoma. And I'm going to summarize it. Boys, 25 years ago, the fathers of these men you were playing on the football field were killing your fathers in the plains of Oklahoma. Get out there and beat Army. Well, in the second half, the Indian boys from Oklahoma go out and they destroy Army. There were some men who were sitting in the stands in New York who saw Jim Thorpe play and they thought to themselves, we've never seen an athlete like that. People will pay money to watch him play. After the game, they approached him and said, listen, we're going to start a fledgling league in Pennsylvania of men who graduate from college who will play football, and we want you to be the president of this new league. And Jim Thorpe says, well, I can't because I'm going to Stockholm for the Olympics. And, of course, if you know your history, you know in the 1912 Stockholm Olympics, Jim Thorpe wins the decathlon and the pentathlon both and becomes the greatest athlete to ever live. When he comes back from the Olympics, he agrees to become the NFL's first president. The National Football League is formed, and I just think it is absolutely stunning that the origin of the National Football League has its place in Oklahoma on April the 6th of 1875 when these Cheyenne, Apache, and Kiowa warriors are captured by the United States Army. But now fast forward. What many people don't know is because Jim Thorpe once played professional baseball, the United States government took away his amateur gold medals from the Stockholm Olympics. So sad. It is sad. Just a few years ago, I met a guy in Enid. He's coming out. I pastor a church there for folks who don't know. And he said, Pastor Wade, I want to meet you. We've been coming for a while. I'd like to get to know you. His name is Gary Thorpe. Mm. I took him out to eat. I said, Gary, are you related to Jim Thorpe? And Gary told me, he said, he said, Wade, that's my grandfather. And Gary has his medals. I, I think the, the, the point of this story is in the state of Oklahoma, there are so many colorful people, so many bright and incredible stories of history that very few people know. But when you look out at the United States and everything that's going on today with the NFL, and Tom Brady and moving from the New England Patriots to Tampa Bay and you look at the Kansas City Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes I think back to the Indian boys from Oklahoma and realize Oklahoma is the place where it really all began. What a golden nugget and that's Oklahoma Gold. <laughs> 